Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and today my guest is Ryan Vatsek. He is the founder of Indie Music Academy, and he is very well experienced in marketing, Spotify, paid ads, all this stuff, the stuff I know our listeners want to learn about. So I'm excited to talk to him today. First, I want him to start out with his story. I always love to start out with where people came from, especially when they are musicians like Ryan. So if you could let us know just kind of your background, Ryan, how you ended up um, really digging into all this marketing knowledge too. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, that's it's kind of weird because yes, I started out as a musician. Uh, I grew up in a musical family. My dad is an elementary school music teacher. Uh, but then I found myself in this world of marketing and it actually... <laughs> It was not a pretty journey. Uh, I'll, I'll cover the highlights really briefly, but I, you know, I grew up as a band kid. I did the band orchestra program, ended up you know, going to college to uh, study music, and I got my BA in classical music with an emphasis in audio recording and sound design. And I wanted to basically become Hans Zimmer. I wanted to be a film composer. And then after class uh, was over, I came back uh, home and I wrote and recorded songs, played guitar, um, you know, was learning Pro Tools, you know, through school. And I used that to record my own music. Um, but when I graduated, I pretty much faced the reality that my degree, while it had like really prepared me musically, it hardly prepared me for business. And I had no clue how to like market myself, uh, how to get clients, how to grow a, fo a following as, as a songwriter. And so this is pretty classic. I was frustrated. And I yeah, I was going to say that's out. my exact story. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was like, they made me such a great musician, but I had no clue what to do with it. Oh, I could, I had every interval memorized. <laughs> yep. I used to be able to tell you the difference between all the Neapolitan chords. That knowledge has left me. <laughs> oh yeah. What about the church modes? Like the things that we yes. learned, you know, it's and so I could crucial. just analyze a piece of music like crazy, but. I didn't know how to then do any kind of marketing. Kind of like how high school doesn't teach you how to do your taxes, you know? Right. That's, that's pretty much what the music <laughs> degree did. I, I ended up having to, uh, you know, find, you know, a job outside of my degree, which a lot of, I'm sure a lot of musicians can relate. I ended up getting a job as a barista at Starbucks, <laughs> um, which was I great. I think a lot can actually relate to being a barista at Starbucks. Yeah. I know a lot of musicians that do that. I, I actually loved the job. Um, I, you know, I love people. I was, you know, enjoying that. And then I had a second job after my shift. So I was sling lattes in the morning. Then I'd drive across town uh, where I was a video editor at a surgery center. Very random and uh, very gruesome. <laughs> but in those years, I barely actually made music, even though I got my degree in it. And it was like my main mission, like just months prior. Um, and so I actually, actually like took a break from music for multiple years, um, ended up like taking my releases down from Spotify, basically just closed up shop, uh, because it was just something that I quit focusing on basically. Mm. Um, I'm curious, why did you take your releases down? Why didn't you just leave them there? I was just thinking like, you know, like I would come back later, I would rebrand. Like I just uh -huh. was like, it was a hard stop where I was just um, like all the momentum had died out. And uh, because I wasn't marketing, that's what I figured out later. I didn't have any strategy. I was just kind of like making music and uploading and then 
tinkering on a website that nobody visited. That was basically what I was doing. Oh, it's a, such a common story. I know. It's like, if I just update my website, right? people will know. No, it, they, It's all about my logo. <laughs> if I have the right logo, yeah. Exactly. So I was, yeah, I was like working at Starbucks, editing surgery videos. And I, I eventually found a job that was in music. I became a worship director at a church. So I would like sing on Sunday and, and lead the band. And that kind of got me, you know, back into playing. And someone at the church was doing a startup um, or starting a startup business. And they needed someone who, you know, kind of knew a little bit of Squarespace you know, kind of knew a little bit about, um, you know, design and editing. And they approached me because, I mean, basically this was like pure luck because I was working, you know, as a video editor at the, at the surgery center. And I had made a few websites for my music in the past. They were like, I feel like you could really help like get us going because he was just a business guy. He wanted to like focus on the mission of the business. And, and so I was like, this is, awesome like it's like a really good opportunity like more money uh and uh it would allow me to quit starbucks and so i can do you know worship leading on on the weekends and then have this marketing job it seemed flexible and it was uh, it seemed like a great idea and it actually it turned out to be life-changing because i learned so much in this position it was a small team of only four people and they like it wasn't the plan but they all kind of looked to me to like fix all of the like <laughs> digital problems. Right. So I ended up doing, you know, all the social media, I ended up writing the copy on the website. Um, we were like, we need to rank on Google. So the, the founder bought me like an SEO course and I learned, you know, search engine optimization. I learned Facebook ads and like the list goes on and on. I was basically the go-to guy for everything marketing and I had to learn it on the spot. But you basically, they paid for you to learn these skills that you could then use later, which is amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's the journey from like classical musician to marketer. And at the time, uh, when I got this job at the startup, things really started firing off and clicking. And I I was like, oh my gosh, I, I didn't really have a structure in my brain for like traffic to a website. I was just like, you know, if it's there, people will see it. But I learned you have to drive traffic, you know, and there's there's, you know, levels of relationships online and you want to kind of have, you know, your customers and fans go through a journey. And all of this was starting to click as I was marketing the shoe company. It it was a shoe company. I think I failed to mention that, but it was a shoe startup and uh, and in the e-commerce world, traffic is very important. It's important across the board, honestly. And so I started just like taking everything I was learning and started writing blogs about it uh, for musicians. And really it was, I felt like I was going to forget the stuff, if I just didn't document it for myself. Mm -hmm. And so it it was a little bit therapeutic. I was like trying to, you know, basically make up for all the lack of knowledge that I had before. And I was writing on the, on my website and, and I started uploading videos to YouTube. And eventually those videos actually started to get views and I started getting more questions and there I saw the need for musicians to learn what I was currently learning at the time so the blog and the YouTube channel turned into me just kind of pouring out what I was getting poured into from the startup and a a big thing that I think lent to the success was I found a a way to contextualize everything I was learning like for the creative person Mm -hmm. for the musician and so yeah, I hope that answers your question. That, no, that I think that's really the- good because whenever, you know, whenever musicians take marketing courses, I think a lot of times they're thinking that's cool, but I don't understand how that fits for me because, mm. you know, I'm dealing with fans or, you know, music is not like the same as as e-commerce, you know, it's not really a product, but it's not really a service, you mm. know, and so I think musicians need those dots to be connected and get mm-hmm. frustrated when they try to take regular marketing courses. Absolutely. And like, it, it is not an exact match. I would say I've, I've spent a lot of time just kind of like processing and thinking like, like, all right, this is what we're doing for 
for shoes and but like what does what is the equivalent in the musician's world and yeah it does take a lot of trial and error at least that's how it was uh at the time for me and what i ended up doing in san diego where i lived at the time is i i started gathering some musicians that i knew and i basically started a like a mini label i call it the farm a farm label because it, i wasn't signing artists that were you know popular or known or anything i i literally started an artist development company and i did all of the recording for them like a, a label would oh gosh so yeah it was crazy and so I, I would basically you know take these artists like try out all of these marketing strategies that i was learning i would also record their music and we ended up getting over a million minutes streamed on spotify in 2018 and that was from triggering algorithms that was from just like keeping a consistent release schedule doing content uh in a semi right way there's really no right way as long as it's authentic but you know having some kind of uh direction and purpose with the content and so that was really encouraging and and that was going on the same time as the youtube channel and uh, it it kind of turned into this thing where i was needed uh to like explain what i was doing to more and more artists and so i i started the indie music academy opened up you know the website and started blogging more and and opened up the spotify service that we still run which since then has gotten over 100 million streams for artists on spotify and uh, it's been crazy after that um that's what led into the spotify growth formula course where I cover everything that I've learned in digital marketing and advertising, specifically contextualized for Spotify. And that pretty much brings us to where we are today, where um, where we are in, in uh, the current state of my life in the Indie Music Academy. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, that number when I saw it on your bio is crazy. The 100 million streams for artists that you've worked with, that's that's insane. And I know that you've worked a lot to try to understand the Spotify algorithm. I think musicians mm. feel like it's just very nebulous. Like we can't, how can we really know? And they, they're frustrated because they feel like it's maybe changing. I know that like a lot of the social media algorithms change a lot. Can you give us some insight into things you've learned about the algorithm? Absolutely. Yeah. So the first thing that I always like to, to share when talking about an algorithm on Instagram or YouTube or Spotify, or whatever it is, is like you can just take algorithm and swap that word with audience or people because all of the algorithms are based off of people's interactions with you. Mm -hmm. And so beyond that, the rest of the algorithm is just how do we take people's actions and all of the people's data and turn it into some kind of event on the platform, right? So the events that we like on Spotify uh, are getting on an algorithmic playlist. Like that's really what we're all trying to go for when we, you know, trigger the algorithm on Spotify, or or getting on, you know, Discover Weekly or the radio algorithm. Some sort of boost in visibility is really the end goal. And so the way that Spotify works it all out is that the musicians with more listeners and more data points it creates a clearer vision for spotify as to who they can recommend the music to so it really comes down to data and if your song isn't streamed very much if you're only sitting at 100 or 200 streams that's not enough data for spotify to truly know who you are as an artist and so then it begs the question well where are these streams coming from how are we going to provide the data for the spotify algorithm to actually chew on it come to some conclusions as to the who the right listener is and uh and that's where marketing comes in because marketing you can think of it from a purely technical term it's like we need to drive traffic to give spotify the right data so that it can make the right recommendation that's all fine but there's also the human side of it we need to attract the right people so that the right people are listening to our music for a long time, which will then signal to Spotify that these are the right people and we need to mirror that in our recommendations. So the two ways of thinking of it 
is really one and the same where it comes down to great music with a great marketing strategy and getting a lot of data for Spotify to understand in order to eventually make its recommendation. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, it's really our job to train the algorithm, right? Because like you said, it can't know what to do if it doesn't have enough data. And the problem happens if you train the algorithm wrong, right? If you send the wrong people there, then it's just going to think, well, these are the people that like it and they're going to go out and get more of those. And if they're the wrong ones, that's not good. So, you know, it is so important, like you said, to make sure that you're you're bringing in the right audience from the beginning so the algorithm knows to find more people like them. Absolutely. Yeah. And and not just that, if if you bring in the, the wrong people, you're, they're actually going to like stream your music a lot shorter. Mm-hmm. Uh, a stream on Spotify, it needs to pass 30 seconds of listening time. Otherwise, you don't even get the royalty. And so, yeah, it, it really does matter. And that also kind of opens up the door to the world of bots because that's a huge temptation uh, that artists have, you know, just to get the number up, to look more popular. Uh, maybe I'll just pay for a, a bot service to run the number up on Spotify so that it, I can give the appearance of having a lot of streams uh, to whomever, maybe for labels, maybe to try and land a gig or a booking manager, you know, fake it till you make it, right? But that, in, in terms of the algorithm, that's actually feeding the wrong data to the algorithm. So maybe maybe you might accomplish some kind of short-term impression on the right person, but that's actually going to tank your hopes of, uh, you know, feeding the the right data to Spotify. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Another thing that comes up around the algorithm is people are always wondering, like, how often do I need to feed it? Like, should I be releasing every month, every six weeks, every two months, you know, what is going to be the most optimal? Have you found any, anything in there? Such a good question. And I feel that this answer is going to be different for every person. Um, Take me, for example. I actually don't release music very often. Uh, In fact, all year, personally, I haven't released a song yet. And it's my goal to release at least one song this year. I've just been so busy uh, teaching other artists and working with my clients. But it is my personal goal to release a song this year. However, my past two releases are still on the Spotify radio algorithm and they have been all year long. And so what I'm, what my theory is because we can only look at the data and try to uh, interpret what is happening behind the data. Right. But my theory is that I'm still on the algorithm because the right people are listening and I'm still getting great engagement. Right? If, if there was some kind of mismatch, then it would have tanked by now. Right. So I'm a case for not releasing very often however the right people are finding my songs okay so mm-hmm. that's bucket number one however there's, there's a, absolutely a good case for releasing it often because a lot of the spotify algorithms and a lot of the data uh, entry points right come from new releases right if you're releasing a new song every month there's the opportunity to get on release radar or new music friday and every new song is an opportunity to promote outside of Spotify as well, because you're creating an event in your musical life. It's an event in your business, right? So you can promote, you can uh, build hype and drive traffic from all those other uh, sources, right? Social media would be a big one. Your mailing list, if you have one, even word of mouth playing shows, all of that are external sources that can drive traffic to Spotify and really help with your growth on that platform. So releasing often is an opportunity for, for that to happen a lot. And, and it's a really good thing to release music um, in terms of driving traffic. I would say that the asterisk to that is if the release is rushed, if it's just not a great representation of what you can do as an artist, then we're going to fall into uh, some problems because it's it's just not going to get the engagement that, that you would want to signal the algorithm that I'm still I'm still at my at the top of my game, you know I still am uh, you know, worthy of this bump, and uh, all Spotify is all, is doing is just looking for signals, and so. I would say if your release is going to be a poor signal, then it's okay not to release. 
just take that time or maybe that song isn't one to release you know because i know there's a temptation as a songwriter to release every song you write but i think it's okay to write those b songs and shove them in a drawer because maybe they're not the one but that's just the creative exercise and uh and waiting for the right song i i think is a good thing now do you think there are those quote b songs that become like an album track or a you know a track on your ep that you're not necessarily releasing as a single still these days i think so yeah so i put and for my i talk about this in the blog a lot i put songs in two categories there's the gathering songs right the ones that are going to be the singles the ones that are going to do really well in a spotify playlist promotion campaign or you know on organic content right it's just very grabby those songs have a you know have requirements obviously they're usually up tempo they have just a great chorus great hook and they have lyrics that just draw you in and probably a great beat too so that's just one type of song and there are so many other ways to be creative that even if it's a great song musically and artistically it might not work in a marketing scenario and that's just the fact of the matter you know maybe a great ballad that is just like you know really heartfelt and you know is going to connect deeply with the listener that might not do so well in a playlist situation just because it doesn't stand out mm -hmm. and there's also less playlist opportunities for ballads in general so i'm not saying that every song uh that is uh when i when i say b song i'm i'm referring to a song that just isn't quite your best work and if if that's uh if that can be reworked later and maybe turned into something that is you know a really great song then yeah i, I think throwing that on the album is fine but i maybe i'm just speaking out of my own creativity like i know as a songwriter ev not every song i write is going to be releasable that's just how i feel and this that's how it was you know in college you know i would just I would just have bad ideas sometimes, you know, I'm not, I'm not shooting, you know, 10 for 10, uh, personally as a creative person. And I need to be okay with that because I think that's where writer's block comes in, where we self-assess, uh, we're too self-critical mm. and we're like, oh, why am I just not, you know, as good as what I'm listening to on Spotify, you know? And I think we need to remember that everything on Spotify that's released by the artists that we look up to it it is a finished release and it has made the cut and we're not seeing the songs that were just filed away or unfinished or the demo will never be released and so that's my belief anyways where i i'm okay with with writing the the 30 songs just to get the 10 mm. you know? yeah yeah and it's hard sometimes because as songwriters often say, there are babies and we don't want to say that some are better than others, but they are. <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, so let me ask about um, with the algorithm. I've heard it said on occasion that there are actually some playlists that you don't want to get on. Like they can actually hurt you. Do you have an opinion about that? Yes, definitely. So there are a few types of playlists like there are the ones that are very personal to the listener they like literally love your song they just dragged it to their own playlist what that is going to do is it's going to generate a very specific type of stream it's going to be called a user owned playlist stream right so it's my own playlist and i'm streaming on my own playlist property so that's fine and you can have those all day long. That's basically the equivalent of someone clicking the heart button mm. uh, on Spotify. Actually, they just changed it. They changed the icon. It's not a heart anymore, but uh, that's the an equivalent to a like on Spotify. Then there is the type of stream where a user listens on a playlist that someone else made, a third party playlister. And this is probably the biggest category other than the spotify owned playlists because this is where uh, influencer marketing campaigns come in you know paid placements where you pitch your song to a curator this is 
something that our agency does at the Indie Music Academy that you've probably heard of Submit Hub or Playlist Push. They also do the same thing where you're pitching your song to curators who have these third party lists not owned by Spotify, right? They're managed by independent people. So that category of stream, it is very important because there's a lot more volume. You're going to get a lot more people listening to your music. And so that's where we have to be careful because it's a lot of data signaling. Mm -hmm. And if it's the wrong data, then we could throw our Spotify in for a loop a bit, you know? And I would say an obvious mismatch would be, you know, being on a playlist that is just clearly not your genre. You know, if you do, you know, acoustic, you know, rock driven music or whatever it is, and you're on something like pretty EDM, it's just not going to be the right listener. Mm -hmm. However, if you're on a list that is generally in the right style, it's getting good engagement, and you're seeing that there's a lot of great artists on the list, then that's actually a pretty great place to be. Uh, if you're seeing that every single musician on the list is just an obscure artist, you've never heard of any single one of them, then you're probably on a bot list because mm -hmm. that's the that's the scam, just to be blunt. It's like, let's lure artists in, promise them streams, and then throw them on some kind of list that is never going to see the light of day for real listeners. Um, but, you know, then they'll be just chock full of independent artists and somehow, you know, their streams are going up and it turns out it's bots. So we always like to identify playlists that are organically ranking in the Spotify search results. That means if you can type in a keyword and that playlist is one of the top five results, it's guaranteed to be getting real human traffic from mm -hmm. Spotify users. So that's a really good sign. And then also the, uh, the artists in the list, if you're seeing top tier A-list artists, that means that people are consuming the music in their regular day-to-day -day life, right? Because it's a very small percentage of people who are always listening to, you know, obscure independent artists. I'm not saying they're not out there, but like, let's just be real. If you're, you know, driving in the car or going in the gym, you're popping your earbuds on, you know, you're, you're going to listen to music that, you know, from artists that you know, and mm -hmm. that's where playlists thrive. Playlists with A-list artists are going to rank at the top of the search and playlists with obscure artists with, where there's no Post Malone, there's no Olivia Rodrigo, there's no Taylor Swift, right? Those are going to fall to the bottom of the rankings because it's just a popularity thing. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you can get placed on a real list that is r actually ranking and has real artists on it, then that is a real influencer marketing campaign because the influence is real. Mm. And so um, that's really uh, the holistic view of like what's dangerous, what is desirable, what's undesirable. And so genre is really just one part of it. It's the quality of the list in my mind is the most important thing because there's so much audience overlap in the user patterns on Spotify. Uh, and by audience overlap, I mean someone who listens to hip hop also listens to pop, right? Someone who listens to pop might also listen to folk, right? And that's because we we as music consumers have multiple taste categories. That's just normal. And so as long as you're getting a good data signal, if we're going to focus on the algorithm, and then if we're going to focus on whether it's real or not, you need to make sure that the playlist is actually, you know, legit and ranking and visible and getting real organic listeners. Those are my main uh, litmus tests to playlist quality. Yeah, those make a lot of sense. Um, mm -hmm. What about the the coveted like Spotify curated playlists? Yeah, now, we don't really have a lot of control of over getting on those for sure. But do you are those always a good thing or are those sometimes not a good thing? Yeah, you know, they're usually a good thing, you know, so the Spotify curated playlists are very similar in the sense that a human picks the songs. So that's the same as like a third party playlist, right? Um, the only difference is that it's someone who gets their paycheck from Spotify, right? So it's, it's someone on the Spotify staff choosing and curating. And obviously they do have, you know, their finger on the pulse 
with music. They know uh, what artists are liked right now. And so if you are added, and usually it would be one a, a niche editorial, right? So something uh, within one of your sub-genres, right? That can be a really good thing. The funny thing is that uh, usually uh, editorial playlists get a little less engagement compared to algorithmic playlists. Mm. And that's because the algorithm is customized to you as a specific listener. And so um, an editorial you know, playlist, it can be a, a huge bump in streams and it feels really good. Um, but from a, a data standpoint, it's really not that different than a third party placement. And it's slightly below triggering an algorithm. So mm. it's a good thing for sure. I don't want to make it sound uh, like you need to avoid it, um, but it's it's definitely a good thing. It's just funny how um, customized content truly is a good thing. And we all experience that with YouTube every single day. The YouTube homepage is customized to us, right? And it's a really good thing when your Spotify playlists are customized to you as well. And so triggering the algorithm uh, is is just a fantastic way to get more visibility on Spotify. And it comes with a great engagement rate along with it. Yeah, I do feel like maybe the the playlists that Spotify creates are not as popular as they used to be just because the algorithmic playlists are so good. Like they really know us. You yeah. know, if we've been on Spotify for a long time as a listener, it really knows what I like. And so yeah. I'm almost always happier with listening to those versus listening to you know, anything that Spotify created around a genre or like the New Music Friday or any of those, because it's just going to be like a lot of the most popular things that generally are not my style anyway. Right. Yeah. I would say that the the best thing about an editorial placement is just new discovery, new listeners, especially using the Spotify search bar, right? So if they're typing mm -hmm. in key words into the search bar, Spotify loves to rank its own stuff high. So just a few minutes ago, we talked about third party lists ranking high, but that's all mixed in with Spotify editorials as well. So depending on what you type in, it could be relaxing music. It could be Christmas songs, any keyword. It could be barbecue music, whatever is happening in your life. You know, you want to find a playlist to match it. Uh, sometimes a Spotify editorial is the first result but a lot of times it's not it could be a third party list that's the, the first result so it really depends um but that's why editorials are so great because in general the spotify editorial lists are ranked pretty pretty high mm. and do you find that people actually do gain like new long-term listeners from that or are they just you know, your, their streams are bumped for a while and then you fall off that playlist and then they just go back down. Yeah, so it it is very turbulent. Uh, the whole playlisting side of traffic generation, I would say, is is very much like an injection that is temporary. This is true for editorials. This is true for influencer marketing campaigns, uh, you know, paid placements, a.k.a. Um yeah, it's it's very turbulent. And I'd say that, you know, it's definitely good to get that visibility. You know, you're you're getting more data. You know, if you get on an editorial, that's really great because that means someone on the Spotify staff hand selected you. Um, but I would just, you know, clarify for everyone listening that it is usually temporary, like for sure temporary. Um, that doesn't mean there are no benefits though, because it is traffic. So while you're on that editorial placement or while you're on that uh, third party placement, um, you know, your followers should go up, your streams should go up, your likes should go up. And that's all good. Even uh, playlist ads should go up because one of the most popular ways, I've mentioned this earlier, one of the most popular ways to save a song is not by clicking the save button, it's actually by dragging it to a playlist that you already hmm. have as a user. And so getting on a playlist is a great way to to get user engagement drags, right? Drags onto people's personal playlists. And that's really great because if you are dragged to someone's personal playlist, you know, just an example, you know, maybe someone really resonated with your song during a breakup 
and they're already building their their breakup playlist that they listen to every night when they're sad right like that's that's a really you know great connection with the song not not great about the breakup but it's a great connection with the artist right and so getting dragged into a playlist is a really great engagement um one of my favorite uh engagement metrics to kind of keep track of whenever i'm uh, just marketing an artist or keep like just kind of keeping a month to month view of what's happening because it's a very intentional uh intentional move it's literally i like this song enough to make this a part of my library yeah no i think that that is that's exactly how i interact with spotify like i don't ever save a song I always put it on a playlist because yes. I'm afraid I'm going to lose track of it or I want to categorize. I'm a categorizing person. So <laughs> I want to categorize it so I can have like things together. You know, I have a lot of personal playlists. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, well, so let's, let's hit this from the other side, the driving traffic side. Right. Um, so what are you driving traffic to, to get these streams on Spotify? Are you driving traffic to a specific track? you know, like a single, are you driving track to traffic to an album or are you driving traffic to a play like a personalized playlist that you've made as an artist? Cause I've started doing that for myself too, because I have different genres that I do, you know, one is Christian, one is classical, one is pop, you know, um, for yeah. my own music. And I've started kind of creating different playlists there. And I thought, well, it makes more sense to drive traffic to a playlist than to just one song, because then they'll listen to more. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the beauty of it is that you can do all of it. You can do whatever you want. You can change at any time. You can switch up your strategy depending on what's happening in your career. Um, so maybe the evergreen version would definitely be you know, either a playlist or just the artist profile. But if you're wanting to kind of narrow down and, and funnel that traffic towards a single, the way that I recommend doing it is by using a platform called Tone Den. It's a smart link platform that I really love. And you can swap out those Spotify links at any time, change the destination uh, for whatever suits you. The magic actually happens one step before they get to Spotify. And um, basically for anyone who's just starting out in this world of uh, direct marketing, we're talking about Instagram and Facebook ads using Meta Business Manager. There's a great suite of tools where you can uh, create uh, posts that are paid ads and you can track everything. There's something called the Facebook Pixel. And what that Pixel does is, or one of the things it does, this is how we use it in the Spotify growth formula. We keep track of everyone that clicks over to Spotify with the Facebook Pixel and we create a custom audience for those people. It's called the conversion event in Meta Business Manager. So we we have this conversion event that whether they're going to an album or whether they're going to a playlist or the artist profile or a single, no matter where the end destination is, that conversion event fires. And it's a signal to Facebook that we found one. We found one of the good ones, one of the people who actually made it over there, right? And so Facebook ads or meta business manager, right? the chain of the name, right? It's a really great learning tool for discovering your unique, you know, fingerprint, your unique artist, uh, or I should say audience fingerprint uh, for your music based off of those clicks. And so that's basically what it looks like. One step before clicking over to Spotify, what I encourage artists to do is to create some uh, of content in a video format, right? So create some sort of video content that demonstrates their their talent, demonstrates their song in an organic way, or I should say um, in a uh, an engaging way. And I, I find that the best way to do that is not necessarily to hire a cinematographer. It's not to do, you know, the, the classic music video where there's like lots of budget, lots of lights. Uh, honestly, the best thing to do is to make videos that look like regular posts mm -hmm. on the on the app right so if you're if you're advertising on instagram just make regular instagram posts but try to make them really inspiring or really good uh, and demonstrating your talent and demonstrating just what what is that cool thing about you as an artist and see if we can capture that on video and uh 
I show them a cool technique to A-B test three or four videos. We can find the winner. It all works together pretty much in the background once you, once you set it up uh, to basically share your best content to brand new people, track them properly so we know if we find one of the good ones. And then, of course, they end up on Spotify where they can experience your music. Yeah, no, that's all that's all very similar to, you know, what I even do for my business and what I encourage musicians mm -hmm. to do. Um are you capturing email addresses along the way? Yeah, so there's a a, a retargeting plan that I, I show my students. Um uh, we retarget those uh those event fires uh and uh I show them how to create a cool offer that is bigger than the music right it's better than just the song and so i tell them put something together like invent something invent some kind of experience or some kind of package some kind of fan starter kit the, whatever you think of it has to be on brand for you there's no wrong answer but think of something that you want to deliver to your fans that's meaningful and just make that you know the bonus for anyone that signs up for your mailing list so that's the simplified version anyways. And so that's, there's definitely, I, I place a lot of value on mailing list growth. It's one of the most important things an artist can do. I know we've been talking a lot about Spotify, but Spotify is the brand awareness that leads to your list growth for sure. Yeah. And I like that you're doing that kind of on the back end or like as the second step of, you know, them kind of that, uh, you know, fan journey, right? So like the right. first thing is hook them into you on Spotify so they keep your song. So then mm -hmm. they keep hearing it. So then when they see these retargeting ads and, you know, they're sitting at their desk and they're listening to their playlist and your song comes on and then you retarget, oh, maybe I do want to, you know, get more exactly. from this artist. Exactly. That makes a lot more sense instead of trying to do that I, I see people oftentimes like trying to turn someone into a fan, like immediately from an ad and try to get them to join an email list to get something for free, but like they don't have enough desire yet to get something from this person because they don't know them well enough yet. Exactly. Yeah. It's you, you said it all comes down to touch points and creating that desire and I love to use Spotify as what would be the content in like a, a traditional, you know, business lead gen uh, strategy, right? So the, the business shares valuable blog posts or valuable uh, insights, right? On their, on their page, right? What's the equivalent for the musician? What's the valuable experience? What's the valuable insight that we can bring as musicians? Well, it's the experience of the song mm -hmm. and it's the experience of the artistry. And so that's why I think Spotify, once again, great brand awareness, right? It's a brand awareness strategy that then drives the rest of the growth for your music business. And I, I think that's one of the best ways to get those touch points to really build um, just the, the demand for your artistry. It's, it, got, it has to happen on Spotify. Yeah, no, that's so good. And that brings us back to what we were talking about near the beginning about how musicians take marketing courses and it doesn't quite translate because they're always like, you have to provide value. And musicians, they don't think that their music is the value, like you just said. They think, oh, I have to come up with some PDF or, you know, I have to even like, you know, in the old days when it was like, oh, here's a free download. People don't really want that now because they're not consuming music that way. But here is a link to this song on Spotify that will be perfect for what they're interested in. That is the value. Would you agree? I absolutely agree. And like that free download idea, wouldn't that be so much more desirable after they've listened to three or four tracks? Yep. And then you offer a song that actually isn't on Spotify because this this is a studio demo from when we collaborated with so-and-so artist, or it's a B-side, never going to be released for subscribers only, right? Or, or it's in some kind of bundle, right? Some kind of uh, just like fan starter kit is the word I always try to get uh, or use to get people's wheels turning. Like, what can you do that's an upgrade from Spotify? Mm. 
because music's already available. That's just the world that we're in. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it's a bad thing if you're trying to make money off of royalties. It's definitely not right. ideal. <laughs> but in terms of our music being ex more accessible than ever, that's a good thing. And when you're starting out, when you're trying to grow in reach and trying to grow an audience, you do want communication channels and uh, and broadcasting channels to be as easy as possible. Because if you remember back to the old days where you had to get on the radio or you had to get in that tour van in order to get the brand awareness, it's a lot easier now. It's definitely a lot easier now, even with the downsides of streaming. And so that just means we might need to rethink where the money comes from. And I, I am a huge proponent for getting, you know, paid more out of streams. You know, that would be uh, a huge step forward. However, I don't think streaming is going to reverse. And I don't want to hang my hat on a pipe dream where it's like, oh, we just need to get back to, you know, downloads or, or physically, you know. It's, it's like Blu-ray freaking out over Netflix, right? What, are you telling me we can't charge $39 for a Blu-ray at Target anymore? You know, what are we going to do? Like, cat's out of the bag. So yep. uh, you're going to have to figure it out. But it's also a really great thing for, for the fact that people are watching movies more than ever now. And so it's just a new puzzle to solve. And the, the movie business is a great analogy. I'm not a, I'm not a director by any means, but um, it's a similar thing with streaming. It's a new problem to solve and it does have its pros and cons. I think we could be honest about the pros and the cons at the same time. Yeah. I mean, I'm always pushing the discoverability aspect that we have now that we never had in the past. And I still see artists, they're just they want to live in the past. They just, they, they're still so angry about streaming and they're just like, I'm going to hoard all my music on my website and only people can only get it there. Okay. So your five fans are going to get it there and you're going to get, you know, this many dollars for it, but you're not going to ever find new fans that way. Yeah. I think it's, it's a, it's a broken mindset around investment, right? Because in all investment is, is delayed gratification. Even with finances, it's like, I'm not going to spend the money now. I'm going to put it into a place where I can't access it because there's going to be a benefit years down the line. And the same is true with streaming. It's like, okay, like, sure, I can try to like hoard my catalog. I, I can try to put it behind a paywall or make it for patrons only or whatever it is. Uh, but that's really, uh, it's, it's thinking about the dollar now, not the dollar later. And I guarantee that there's going to be more monetization opportunities once your audience is larger compared to whatever size it is now, right? If, if you can just 10X your audience by delaying gratification, I think you're going to make a lot more than 10X your money. Mm. So, I like that analogy of the, you know, the investment. I always talk about your audience or your email list being, you know, your asset that you can you can rely on for years to come. And that's, that's a similar what to what you said. So it's very true. Uh, all for that. Yes, absolutely. Well, this has been super helpful and enlightening and I appreciate getting your clarification on a lot of things and especially in relation to Spotify. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to tell indie artists out there that we haven't covered? Oh man. <laughs> uh, that was a, that was a very open-ended question. <laughs> I think like just to kind of in conclusion, we did talk a lot about, you know, algorithms and, and marketing and just ads, but it really, it all comes down to, uh, to two things that have to happen at the same time while you're marketing, while all of this craziness is going on, your songs have to be good and you have to move with confidence, right? That, that's part of your brand, right? The confidence is part of your artist brand, right? And, and sometimes as musicians, we're afraid of maybe the technology, maybe we're afraid of the algorithm, um, maybe we're afraid of even learning, you know, about a, a social media platform or how to do ads or how to, how to graduate into this new music business and actually figure out how it works, right? It's all very scary. But rest assured, the, the biggest factor still 
is making sure that the music is absolutely wonderful for people to connect with. And so it really does, um, it really does all start with just how well are you, are you feeding your artistic soul and how well are you being honest with yourself with how good you are. And like I said earlier, I'm not always like <laughs> feeling like my stuff is good, right? Some songs are not going to make it out. And I think that's okay. I think it can be a real temptation to put the blinders on, think, you know, everything I touch turns to gold. I don't understand why people aren't listening to my music. Like something's wrong with them. Let's let's just take it back a level. And my encouragement would be the war of art is a struggle. And not every song is going to be a good song. What truly brings success is just consistency over time. Okay. So if you can just walk the walk and stay the course and and be consistent and be honest with yourself. Is this something that I should release? Or is this just going to be an exercise in creativity? Right? Because there's satisfying your creative self, but there's also making the right business decisions, right? And those are sometimes at odds with each other, right? It's like, oh, I love this song. I love this is my baby. I wrote it for so and so and and like it means so much to me. And that is wonderful. And you should record those songs and you should pursue those creative ideas. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be a winning ad. Doesn't mean it's going to, you know, get accepted by curators. It doesn't, it's it, there's no guarantee. Uh, that cre all creativity is going to resonate. And so I think that uh, understanding that artistry is up and down. Artistry is, I feel really good and I, I just don't feel so good today. Understanding that consistency through all of that is really what makes for a successful musician. I think that if we can just meditate on that and keep that mindset in every other thing that we do whether it's ads whether it's pitching to playlisters whether it's figuring out the algorithm you know launching our patreon whatever it is just make sure you approach it with that um with that heart and i think you'll be just fine mm, love it you're speaking my language that's a yeah. mic drop moment right there so thank you for that um that passionate oh um you know just just reminding artists why we're here, like what we're doing. And sometimes we can get a little lost in the data and, and stuff. And, you know, some artists, they don't, don't learn the data. They don't learn the marketing. They're just too much on the creative side. And then sometimes we can get too lost on the, the analytical side and forget that we are artists and we are creating art and, you know, we need to feed that creative soul. So thank you for bringing it back around to that. How can people uh, get in touch with you and connect with you on social media, your website, all of that? Yes. Yeah, so once again, my name is Ryan Vatsek. That's spelled W-A-C-Z-E-K. If that's too hard to type in, just type <laughs> Indie Music Academy. That's the name of the website uh, and all of the socials, uh, IndieMusicAcademy.com. And uh, for anyone who wants to hear more about my thoughts, uh, learn more about Spotify, how the algorithm works. I do have a free workshop and that's just at IndieMusicAcademy.com slash workshop. And you can access that uh, at any time. It's on demand video and uh, everyone's welcome and it, it gets delivered uh, instantly. And and also any uh, anyone who wants to email me uh, can email me. Uh, I also have a mailing list uh, where I send out um, you know, marketing insights, music industry tips. Uh, right now I'm working on a video talking about all the different types of music royalties and how to collect all of them. Uh, so that's going to go out soon on the mailing list. Uh, so there's a lot of value there as well. And uh, if anyone wants to start formally learning uh, a marketing strategy to grow their music, they should jump into the Spotify growth formula or at least check it out. And I'm always available to uh, answer any questions that anyone has about uh, marketing or the music industry. Uh, I'm an open book and uh, looking forward to connecting with 
any of the listeners who uh, liked what I had to say, my long rambles. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. I love that you shared very specifically as I asked very specific questions. So I appreciate you doing that on the podcast. I know it's going to be helpful to people. It's going to get them excited to learn more. So go out and check out the websites that he mentioned and connect with Ryan. Thanks so much, Ryan, for all of your you. insight today on the show. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician. 